In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ave. of the Lord and his mercy be upon you through his grace and love for mankind at all times, both now and ever and in the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. I am so pleased to reintroduce Dr. John Papino, our speaker tonight. He is a professor of Greek, Latin history, and patristics at Our Lady of Guadalupe Seminary in Denton, Nebraska. His master's degree is in classical Greek and Latin and his doctorate is in the Fathers of the Church. He has published on the Fathers of the Church and on contemporary church history, particularly Vatican II and the liturgy in the 20th century. His most recent publication is the English translation of Yves Chiron, Annibale Bunyini, Reformer of the Liturgy. And of course, many people joining us tonight will remember him as our excellent history professor from last year. Dr. Papino, it's so good to see you again. Welcome, Likewise, Annie, good to see you. Good to see you, Father. So tonight we're going to speak of Justinian. Saint Justinian for the Easterners. Father Hezekiah was, was uh, instructing me on this. We talked about this earlier. Is he a saint in the West? I will let Dante answer when we get to that. But I usually follow Dante for the Western tradition. The question is, Doctor, is he a saint in heaven? Yes, yes. that is the question. And Dante will tell us where Justinian is. Oh. But I'll, I, Father, I, I will give you a clue, okay? I'm going to be reading from this book. Okay, all right, okay, okay, there you go. Just a little preview for Okay, you. good. Okay. You're making me nervous. Oh, no. <laughs> be not afraid. So, Justinian, now we're going to turn our gaze towards the east, and it is, I think, a defect of the way we're generally taught history. I speak here of us poor Westerners, okay? Is we tend to th see history in this way. The ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, all is gleaming white marble, order, beauty. Then the fall of the Roman Empire, the Dark Ages. What happened in the east, though? So I'm going to give you a little bit of background to what is, after all, the uninterrupted succession of the Roman Empire is the Empire of the East. And Justinian is one of the great emperors of the Roman Empire as it continues in the East, continues a bit in the West too. So I'll talk about that a little bit, uh, where the split happens between the East and the West from a civil point of view. We'll look at Justinian the man what Byzantium was like in his day, what his reign was like, what he did, and what really makes him an extraordinary figure, not only of the East, but also of the West, and hopefully shed a little bit of light on what really was happening in the sixth century, an age which in the West was the age of the Franks, the Merovingians, Ostrogoths, Visigoths, and Vandals, but what was going on in the East? And, and Justinian is, is the great, one of the great emperors. Why is he great? As we shall see, he's great through his conquests. He was a man with a dream, and he brought this dream to pass, namely the rebirth of the Roman Empire to nearly its complete former glory. 
a great builder of buildings which to this day elicit admiration and indeed awe. He also gave his empire a code of law which was so well thought out and so comprehensive that it would provide inspiration for the great law codes of the West centuries after his death. In fact, and to explain all of this, on whom shall I rely? I shall rely, of course, on uh, Dante Alighieri, our Italian poet, for what happens to Justinian after death. I will, this may surprise some of you, I am going to rely on a book I think I can recommend, although with some caveats, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. The style of the English is unsurpassed, I think. It has one big flaw, which I will warn you of. He was, Edward Gibbon was anti-Catholic. And you can, but fortunately, he was so over the top anti Catholic that you can really tell where he's going off the handle in that direction. And you can still take the good fruit from among the brambles and thorns of his anti Catholic invective. And if you really want to dig deep into the empire of Justinian, and if you have a scholarly turn of mind, this lady scholar here, Averill Cameron, wrote this book, Procopius in the 6th century. Now, who is Procopius? And you need to know a little bit about Procopius to understand Justinian. Procopius was lived in the reign of Justinian, and he is the principal source we have for the reign of Justinian. He lived at the time, and he wrote three books on the reign of Justinian. The Wars, on the Wars of Reconquest, the edifices or buildings on the building program of Justinian, and then another work intended to be published after the death of Justinian and his emperor Theodora called The Anecdotes, also known as The Secret History, which is not recommended reading for anyone at all. It has lots of gossip in there. I'll rely on it a little bit, but I really don't recommend you read that. And one has to understand Procopius to understand the reign of Justinian. The great Justinian has um, elicited different reactions. Dante loves him for his own reasons. Edward Gibbon, although he admires the man, in the end has a negative judgment on him. And I will not judge him myself. I will leave that to you. I will not be able to give you all the elements, of course, but I hope to give you enough elements, at least that you can have a feel for the man and his century. Now, <clears throat> Let's go back to the Roman Empire. In the late, I'm going to go back to the third century. The late third century, the empire is still pagan, and it has become too big and unwieldy for a single emperor to run. So the emperor Diocletian, who's also known for his persecutions of the Christians, splits it in two, and on either side of the split, which goes right through the middle, right through the Balkans, To administer the two halves, there'll be two emperors who work together, and then they'll each have a sort of prime minister to succeed to them and to learn the ropes. And this was a way to stabilize the thing, and it worked as far as it went. So that's 293. The next event to bring us closer to the time of Justinian is the reign of Constantine the Great, the Oriental Church, or the Orientals of the church, call him Saint Constantine, equal to the apostles. It is he who makes Christianity legal. It is he who is converted, the first emperor, publicly anyway, to be converted. And it is from Constantine on that the empire becomes Christian. From about 313 on, very slowly, and then we can have the first ecumenical council of Nicaea, 325, the other great councils, the Council of Constantinople in 381, that's after Constantine, he dies in 337. Now in 381, the Council of Constantinople, another an ecumenical council, is organized and assisted by an emperor also, Emperor Theodosius, who is the last man 
to be emperor of both sides. Constantine is because his uh, partner in the East dies. So there'll be two, sometimes two, sometimes one emperor. Theodosius to the last, and Theodosius lays the groundwork. Why? He, after a, 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 a near, uh, 75 years of emperors who sometimes favored the Arian heresy, Theodosius is certainly Catholic, and it is he who makes Catholicism the religion of the empire in the year 380. You have to wait from, from Constantine 313, his conversion, and his vision of the cross in heaven, all the way to 380, official Christianity is not always quite right. Now we have official Catholicism from 380 on. And after him, though, so Theodosius reigns until 395, and he divides the empire again between his sons for succession, and never again will all of the Roman Empire be under one emperor. Or will it? I think we can say that Justinian is in fact going to be able to pull it off. Now, in the East, the succession of Eastern emperors continues. We were going to go through dynasties and changes, palace coups, emperors who die without children. History is going to go on over there of an empire. In the West, the Germanic, the Germanic tribes take over. Slowly, sometimes violently, sometimes through treatises, until finally in 476, the last legitimate emperor of the West is deposed by a German general by the name of Erdoecker. And from that time forth, and from then on, the West is divided up into various kingdoms. The Ostrogoths have Italy. The Franks and the Burgundians have France. The Visigoths have southwestern France and Spain. The Vandals have North Africa. Of all of these tribes, only the Franks are Catholic after the conversion of Clovis on Christmas Day of 496 or 498, depending on the chronology you use. The others, all the other Germans, Vandals, Ostrogoths, Visigoths, are also Aryan Christians. And so the West is run by a foreign race with an alien religion. And that's, we're going to see how Justinian deals with that. But always there remained among learned men even the monks the dream of a unified empire indeed the germanic kings of europe themselves were not conscious of having created something separate they saw themselves merely as occupying parts of the roman empire Byzantine, well, I should say Roman coin minted in Constantinople was still used in the West. The Merovingian kings are going to add their own. And on paper, a lot of these Germanic kings presented themselves as being Roman administrators. As strange as it may seem, that's how, and sometimes the Byzantine emperor would indulge that fantasy. Oh, yes, my dear proconsul, Visuginthus, you get the idea? Now let's get to Justinian. So we move back to the uh, east. And we're now in the early 6th century. Justinian is the nephew of the emperor before him, Justin. And what's interesting here, in terms of east and west, we often think of the difference in language. Justinian's uncle, Justin, did not know Greek. He was still a Latin-speaking man. He was a soldier. He happened to be illiterate, but because he had what it took, the Senate of Constantinople, the city that Constantine built in the West, in the East, I beg your pardon, they choose him. And he becomes emperor in 580. He had very good advisors, including his nephew Justinian, who effectively Justinian, our man here, is going to help rule and indeed start ruling by himself in 524. And in 527, he inherits the kingdom. Justinian is now bilingual Latin and Greek. 
the language of the East is Greek, okay? But Latin remains the official language of imperial business, of the law, and of the army. But increasingly, a, a language detached from the language of the people, Justinian knows both. What is his personality? It is generally agreed that he was a bit of a, what we today would call a micromanager. He liked to get down into the details and tell people how to do things exactly. He was somewhat despotic. He was a defender of Christianity, which means he was a persecutor of heretics. Now, but surprisingly, he was not himself immune from heresy. And politics and religion played a role here. We'll get to that uh, in due course. Now, he begins his reign, and several events in his reign are important. One of them is an interesting revolt that happens at the very beginning that is, in a sense, going to purify things and allow him to forge his own reign, kind of on the ashes of the former reigns. How is this? There had been growing resentment among the people in the, in the, in the Byzantine Empire. Excessive taxation, on the one hand. Also, there, these people were mad about chariot racing. It's hard to convey how important chariot racing was. There's a huge hippodrome in the middle of Constantinople. You can still, if you go there today, my wife and I took our, our honeymoon in Turkey, actually. And so we saw, you can still see the center of the hippodrome. And the huge town square is the hippodrome. I mean, the bleachers are gone and so forth, but you can really tell you're in a hippodrome. And there were various teams, the blues, the greens, the whites, the reds. And everyone picked a team. And much like foot soccer, football in the UK in the 70s and 80s, these teams had hooligans attached. Also, politicians would hire the hooligans of the chariots teams to cause trouble. The emperor himself had a favorite team, the greens. And the blues resented this. And the chariot races were the occasion for people to voice their discontent. And one day at the chariot races, this is the year 532, there was a great revolt of the blues versus the emperor. Mind you, the greens joined in too. They could, they, the complaint was about taxation, about the charioteers not winning, about a couple of charioteers having been imprisoned for getting into a brawl. The upshot of it is, that the crowd got out of hand, the, the emperor nearly fled. But his wife, to whom I shall get, said, no, stand tall. And ultimately, half of Constantinople was burnt down, including the old church that Theodosius, remember him all the way back in the fourth century, had built, a church built to the glory of St. Sophie, Holy Wisdom, burnt to the ground. And Constantine is going to rebuild the city. And I'm going to show, he's going to rebuild the Church of Holy Wisdom. And this is his best known building. Let me show it to you very quickly. We'll look at other buildings later, perhaps. But I do want to show you um, this uh, excellent building. It is called the Hagia Sophia. There it is. You recognize this, ladies and gentlemen? Now, the spiky rockets are Turkish Muslim, so you can forget about them. But there's the Church of Holy Wisdom, Hagia Sophia. Look, there's the sea. And that dome, unsurpassed until modern times. Just astounding. So Justinian, I think if we're going to give him the title of saint, the building of this church alone would justify it. Here's the interior. You see the dome? Now, unfortunately, the Muslims have put their own medallions with whatever these names uh, mean. Let me show you one more picture of the interior. There's, if you were to lie on your back at the bottom, the dome. You see cherubim here. And this thing... It doesn't really do it justice. It's massive. I, I mean, I've been in there, and it really will make you dizzy. The height, the space, it dwarfs the Pantheon. If you've been to the Pantheon, then go to the Hagia Sophia. So he rebuilds this, and there'll be more. 
So that's the kingdom. Now, I've mentioned Theodora. And one thing I want to tell you, I'm going to be quoted from Gibbon because his English is so beautiful. This is Gibbon on, the, on Emperor Justinian. In the exercise of supreme power, the first act of Justinian was to divide it with the woman whom he loved, the famous Theodora, whose strange elevation cannot be applauded as the triumph of female virtue. She had been a burlesque dancer. And that's why he said it's not a triumph of female virtue. But, and she's the one during the Nika riots, the riots I mentioned, they're called Nika. Nika means conquer or beat, defeat, defeat. That's what the people shouted. Nika, Nika, meaning beat him, beat him, get him. Justina was going to flee and Theodore says, no. And she said something like, the kingship, the queenship is a beautiful sepulcher by which she meant you and I should rather die as emperor and, em and empress than live as anything else. And she put the backbone in the man, and he did stay, and things quieted and went back to peace, and that was the end. A lot of people died in the suppression. Fine. That's history. But he, he, that enabled him then to have a peaceful reign at home. I mentioned the dream that all men had at the time, including sometimes the Germanic kings of the West, that there really was one empire. And Justinian wants that. And he's going to spend a great deal of money to conquer the West militarily. Let's take a look at a map. Here is the map of the Mediterranean Basin. The orange bit is the Byzantine Empire as he found it when he became officially emperor of Byzantium. As you can see, it is simply the Eastern Empire, and the line very much corresponds to the line that Diocletian had drawn. By the end of his reign, he dies in 565, he had taken back nearly the entire coastline in a succession of wars. North Africa against the Vandals, Italy against the Ostrogoths, and in Spain against the Visigoths. And for most of this, his general and admiral is going to be a man by the name of Belisarius, whose secretary was Procopius. And that is why Procopius can give us such detail about all of the, these uh, events. 533, only a year after the Nika revolt and the building of what we now consider to be the great Hagia Sophia, the Byzantines take a fleet and they go to Carthage. Not to get into the details, but the Vandals were Arians. They oppressed the Catholic Church. They oppressed their subjects. And the good Roman Latin speaking people of North Africa welcomed the Byzantine fleet and soldiers as liberators. Justinian is rebuilding the old Roman Empire. So the captured king of the Vandals is brought back to Constantinople and paraded in an old fashioned Roman triumph, just as in the days of Julius Caesar and Pompey the Great and all and Trajan and Hadrian and all those people from way back. We're told that this campaign alone, Procopius is speaking, cost Justinian 100,000 pounds of gold. I did the calculation based on today's price for an ounce of gold, six billion dollars US of today. And this was not the US. Next, Italy. Belisarius takes Rome on the 9th of December of 536 and then takes Ravenna in the north, that had been the capital of the Ostrogoths, in 540. Now, Strange events take place at this time. I'll get back to them in a moment. For the time being, I just want to focus on the rebirth of the Roman Empire. There'll be a second phase for 541 to 54. Another man comes in to replace Belisarius. His name is Narses. And he crushes the Orthodox, the Ostrogoths all the way, and even repels Franks who come in to see if they could uh, pick anything out for themselves. 
This cost 300,000 pounds of gold. And then they go over and take the coast of the, or the coast of, Italy, of uh, Spain from the Visigoths. So you can see it's pretty close to the Roman Empire in the days of um, Scipio Africanus and Hannibal, when Hannibal, when the, the Carthaginians are finally defeated by the Romans in the Carthaginian Wars. We're pretty much back to those days. So from that point of view, I think we can say that Justinian was able really to get back to the beginning of the Roman Empire. How long will it last? They're going to keep North Africa until the Muslim invasions. So that's a pretty long time. Italy, after, long, sometime after Justinian, will be lost to the Lombards. But to be honest, the Byzantines are not going to run Italy very closely. And in fact, by the time you get to St. Gregory the Great in the year 600, the Pope, the Pope has to take over running Italy from the Byzantines, who really aren't taking care of it very well. And that is the origin of the Papal States, by the way. That's how that transition happens. As for Spain, the Visigoths will, in fact, take it back. And there again, we'll have to wait for the Muslims for the visit to come along for the Visigoths to be completely repelled northwards. So much for the, the, the renovation of the empire. And that's the word that was used at the time, in Latin, mind you, renovatio imperii, the renewal of empire. So that's what he was about. And the people were over the moon joyful with this. But they won't be joyful very long because of the taxation it's going to require to pay back all this money. And ultimately, not to get too far into the, weed, far into the weeds, this war, there's also a concurrent war with the Persians. The Persians are the other great empire to the east. And ultimately, a century later, the Byzantines are going to war with the Persians again. And all of these wars are, are going to deplete the Byzantine Empire to such a, an extent that a ragtag band of Arabs out of the desert with a new fervor, a new faith, are going to be able to take it over. And that's what explains how it is. If you ever wondered how this small band of Arabs led by, by Muhammad and then his successors were able to take over the, the Byzantine Empire, not all of it, but a good bulk of it, certainly all of North Africa to Spain, how they were able to take Persia is because of this war, the, all of these wars. Now let's take a look at the law, the Justinian Code. Justinian wants to tighten things up, and he appoints a 10-man commission to codify the law and it takes them 14 months to do this the last time this attempt had been made by theodosius him again so theodosius and justinian kind of the hinges of the byzantine empire it had taken nine years this new code with a few updates later on is going to be the law of byzantium until it falls its official version, by the way, is in Latin. Law is conservative. You have to wait for Heraclius later on. He's the one who um, brings the Holy Cross back to Jerusalem after the Persians took it, among other things he did, is going to be the first one to move the law into Greek officially. It had been done unofficially, but now law is going to be Greek. But under Justinian, law is Latin. To make this law... They went all the way back to the reign of Hadrian around the year 200, and they collected all that is good of the law. And Justinian's principle was to get rid of those aspects of the law that were a waste of time or indeed that could oppress the poor. How's this? Well, the law had become so arcane, and some of the practices of the law went all the way back to the very foundation of Rome as a city, they involved superstitious practices which were deemed essential for the validity of contract and so forth. And if you didn't perform the right forms, the contract could be invalid.
but you had to know the law to know that. And very often the poor man didn't know exactly the arcane aspect of the law, whereas the nobleman did. And I'm going to read to you some of these arcane aspects of the form of contract, and you'll see how you'd have to be a great expert to know this. Uh, Edward Gibbon lists a few uh, for us. Um, but before I, <laughs> now that I'm moving on to the law, this is what Gibbon says regarding Justinian's law as compared to his buildings. It's beautiful. Or rather his victories in the West. The vain titles of the victories of Justinian are crumbled into dust, but the name of the legislator is inscribed on a fair and everlasting monument. He means the Justinianic code. So here are some of the procedures he got rid of. In a civil action, the plaintiff touched the ear of his witness, seized his reluctant adversary by the neck, and implored in solemn lamentation the aid of his fellow citizens. If you fail to grab the ear of the witness, if you fail to put your hand on the neck of your adversary, and if you failed to appeal to the aid of your fellow citizens, you lost. But you had to know this. And so, as Gibbon goes on to say, and many others besides with which I won't bore you, but the point is, as he says, this occult science of the words and actions of law was the inheritance of the pontiffs and the patricians, he meaning the nobility. So it was very easy work for the nobility and the educated to defraud the poor through the observance of these forms. Justinian cleared all of that out. And by the end of this lecture, by the way, I will read to you the words of Dante in translation because they sum up a lot of the things I've been mentioning. The law defends Christianity as the religion of state. It outlaws the heresy of Nestorianism. It outlaws the practice of paganism. There still was some of that going on. Also, there is something tender about this law. The view it takes of women, for example, it protects women from forced prostitution. And even it provides that before a man may undertake a huge debt, his wife must be consulted not once, but twice. She has to give her consent twice before the husband can engage all the wealth of the family, which is good. It prevents the husband from, you know, taking out friv frivolous uh, loans. And by the way, the loans also are completely codified. Uh, let me see if I can uh, find this for you. Uh, got procedures there. Uh, rates of interest. There we go. Listen to this. Persons of illustrious rank were confined to the moderate profit of 4%, meaning that a wealthy banker could not charge more than 4% uh, loan. Now, I know that rates happen to be low right now, but think of your mortgage back in the 80s. 4% is pretty low. Six was pronounced to be the ordinary and legal standard of interest, just for general loans. Eight percent for the convenience of manufacturers and merchants, and so forth. And it goes up as high as 12 percent for um, uh, investments or ventures at sea, like, you know, going across the sea to get spices and things. All of these are there. Now, I mentioned the orthodoxy of Justinian. I mentioned that his law makes Christianity um, or repeats that orthodox Christianity is the religion of empire. But there's a problem in the empire of Justinian in the sixth century when it goes all the way back to the Council of Chalcedon. There is a heresy that claims. Well, first of all, reminder of what orthodoxy is regarding the person of our dear Lord Jesus Christ, that he is namely one person in two natures, right? We saw this in history class, you all know this from the catechism. There was a tribe of heretics called the Monophysites, Monophysites who believed, no, no, there's only one nature there. There's a divine nature that took on human attributes, maybe there were various schools, or it was some sort of a blend between the divine and the human, one nature. And it happened to be the case that that heresy was most widespread in the, the provinces bordering the Persian Empire, particularly Syria. And these Monophysites were crucial for the defense of the empire in that region. And 
For that reason and other reasons, Justinian sought to placate them. It should also be added that at this time, at any rate, Theodora was herself an open uh, um, member of that heresy, one nature only in Christ. And that that's kind of a crack in the otherwise pretty homogeneous picture I think I've drawn of, um, of the uh, 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 empire of uh, Justinian. And Justinian will try to reconcile the Monophysites by retrospectively condemning some Orthodox writers who might be misunderstood as Nestorians. It's called the Three Chapters Controversy. I won't go into detail. But the worst of it is that, going back to Italy, the conquest of Rome, Belisarius and his wife Antonina really was the person moving this, Belisarius was devoted to Antonina, just as Justinian was to Theodora. And Theodora and Antonina were friends, sometimes rivals, but usually friends. And Theodora really wanted the Council of Chalcedon, which condemned the Monophysites and declared the two natures in Christ. She really wanted the Pope to turn back the clock and, and really to promulgate the heresy as being the proper religion. And she did this through a terrible means. And this is the one blot on this whole reign. They deposed the Pope of Rome and they replaced him with a deacon called Vigilius to their own liking. This deacon or archdeacon Vigilius had been the nuncio of Rome to Constantinople. He was the Aprocrisarius is the name. And she had tempted him with the promise of 700 pounds of gold and the papacy. They had a private meeting in which she said, I will give you 700 pounds of gold. I will give you the papacy if you promise to rehabilitate the Monophysites and indeed to roll back Chalcedon and say that Christ only has one nature. And this man said, yes, the soldiers take Rome. Belisarius with his wife Antonina. It's a terrible scene. Procopius describes it. The Pope of Rome, the leader of Christians, is brought into the palace of the general, whom he sees sitting on the ground at the feet of his wife Antonina, who's sitting on the bed. And he is stripped of his signs of office and sent away into exile by soldiers. And immediately, with pressure from the general, the clergy of Rome assent to the election of Vigilius. Who's the Pope? Well, the Pope is the man, Silverius, who's been sent away. Vigilius is no Pope. He's a usurper. He's imposed. But, and this is my favorite part of the story. So now he's supposed to, by the way, start preaching heresy. He's been paid for it. To deny a council and to deny the truth about our Lord. It's terrible. Whereupon his predecessor dies in his dungeon of starvation, we think. Vigilius knew this. But suddenly, upon the death of his predecessor, well, upon the death of the legitimate pope, the see is now vacant. And since he, Vigilius, this evil bad man, is acknowledged as Pope of Rome by the clergy, that's as good as an election. He does become the pope. Will he promulgate heresy? No. At that moment, it seems, a change came upon him. The grace of state, it's called. The Holy Ghost not only present, prevents him from promulgating heresy, the promise of Christ, but he even wakes up and he says to the Empress, I'm reneging on my promise. It was an evil, bad promise. I will not do it. And he's summoned to Constantinople and he says to the face of the emperor and the empress, you will never touch St. Peter. You can torture me and you can kill me, but St. Peter you will never touch. Anyway, long story short, it didn't work at all. And Justinian, what was he thinking the whole time? It seems he was trying to placate his wife, placate the Monophysites in Syria, uh, it's complicated, but tradition tells us that he repented of it 
and did indeed accept the truth regarding the two natures of Christ, as instructed by one of the successors of Virgilius, whose name is Agapetus, to which we shall get back. So I needed to say that. Um, now, more on the building program. Let's get something lighter now. I showed you the photograph of Hagia Sophia, which goes back to Justinian. It cost 20,000 pounds of gold, which isn't that much compared to those conquests in the West. Many chapels, many shrines, mosaics. It's nothing like what was there before, by the way. It's the third church dedicated to holy wisdom on that point. And that dome, how does it stay up? I'll give you the two reasons given, one of which you can verify for yourselves. That dome is made of pumice stone. In fact, Procopius says pumice stone so light that it floats on water. So it's pretty light structure, number one. If you ask the Christians who live to this day in Constantinople, they will tell you that the relics of the holy saints which are put in there are what keep the dome up. I'll leave you with both of those images. And it's become really... Oh, and by the way, once it was built, Justinian is reported to have exclaimed, Solomon, I have outdone thee. Wow. Wow. So that's Justinian for you. But he builds more things. And I want to show you more pictures, okay? So let's go back to the empire for a bit. There we are. Ah. This, by the way, we're in Hagia Sophia. So this is one of the mosaics inside of Hagia Sophia. Here is Our Lady. It says so in Greek, Meter Theou, Mother of God. Here's our dear Lord on her lap. And here are two men. This man, if you can read Greek letters, Constantinos, ah, Constantine, offering the city of Constantinople. And here on the left, Eustinianos, offering, there's the dome, the very church in which this is a mosaic. So you have a representation of the church in the church, offering it to them. So this is pretty typical art here of the time. I wanted to show you that. The next thing I want to show you, I'm going to expand this a bit. Now, you'll recall that Ravenna in the north of Italy was the capital of the Ostrogoths. It had been one of the capitals of the Roman emperors too. They moved around. And it's going to be the seat of government of Byzantine Italy. This is San Vitale in Ravenna. So that's the exterior of it. It has a dome too. It's not as grand as the Hagia Sophia, but nevertheless, a pretty imposing building. This is the inside of it. Here's our Lord, you see. Look at the mosaics. Look at It's just gorgeous. And this church is, I think, the most famous thing in it. Well, I'll show you this first, of course. Here's the sacrifice of Isaac. Here there are three visitors, right? The Trinity, the three angels. And just lovely stuff. Look at that. Here's Christ here. Just beautiful. And then we're still inside San Vitale of Ravenna. This is Justinian. This is Belisarius, the general, we think, next to him. This is... The Bishop of Ravenna, Maximianus, is the only one who's got his name written. Got some deacons there. There's a thurifer, some soldiers, the retinue. So this gives you an idea. This is a representation of what Justinian was with his retinue, clergy, and soldiers. Facing this mosaic, on the other side, there's Theodora with her attendants, her ladies-in-waiting. And... What's remarkable about this mosaic, there are several representations of her, but this mosaic really comes close to representing the way Procopius describes her. She's relatively slight framed. I mean, she's made to be taller than the other attendants, so she stands out. You can tell she's not a very stout woman. She's slender. You can tell by her chin, perhaps. Uh, I'm not sure the photo renders this, but she was known to have a very pale complexion. She did die, she did die of cancer, by the way, in 548. 20 years before Justinian, he was inconsolable. Pearls, 
So she's a strong woman, strong gaze. She was known to be very beautiful uh, and slender. And you can see, by the way, <laughs> the, the clothing with a little tapestry worked in here. Just very um, lovely stuff. So that's Theodora. A um, few more pictures I want to show you. Now, this is a church in Bulgaria, which was part of the Byzantine Empire. And this is St. Sophie. It's another Hagia Sophia. It's smaller. And by the way, this church gave its name to the capital of Bulgaria, Sophia. If you go in, you can have an idea of the grandeur of it. This, ah, back in Constantinople, part of the building program here. This is a famous cistern underground. Constantinople was fed with water. It was an ancient city. Waters and baths everywhere. And by the way, there is a bath in present-day Istanbul, the Turks call it, which goes back to the days of Justinian, which is still in operation. And I know this because I went there for a steam bath and it's, it's amazing. You feel like an extra in a film that takes place in the, in the sixth century. Now this cistern, there is some carp in there and so forth. You can access it. It's made famous by one of the James Bond movies. Some of you may remember it where he goes into these cisterns. I don't remember which one, don't ask me. So that's all part of the building program of Justin. We don't have everything. And by the way, he will be buried in the Church of the Twelve Apostles, where Constantine was buried. And unfortunately, and Father Hezekiah can tell you more about this, his tomb, which was magnificent, will be destroyed and his remains scattered by the, the crusade, the crusaders in 1204 during the sack of Constantinople. So that doesn't say much for us Westerners, uh, but there it is. Now, um, I'll get back to the law in a moment. From an intellectual point of view, Justinian was a Christian uh, to the point of being anti-pagan. And in fact, it was he who closed the Academy of Athens that went all the way back to the days of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, the Stoics, the Epicureans. Justinian promulgated a law saying pagans can't teach anymore. So there's a bookend there for an ancient pagan institution the Academy at Athens. Um, the one thing that remained, though, was the great law school in Beirut, where Latin was taught along with the law, but it was destroyed. After the Codex was written, the Code of, the, the code of Law, it was destroyed by an earthquake in 551. Justinian tried to refound it, but really never was back to its former glory. So under his reign, one by an act of his, the other one by an act of God, we find the end of the study of the law, just in time. He promulgates the code and the great law school is, is, is struck by an earthquake and the pagan academy of Athens comes to an end. Other accomplishments of his, just a few things. Under his reign, finally, Western has got a hold of silk worm eggs. Until then, silk had to be imported from China. It was very expensive. But a couple of monks, missionaries, came back from the Orient with silkworm eggs. And the Western as well, Eastern Empire, learned how to husband them. And from that day to this, we've had silk grown right there on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. And even the Turks to this day will make um, carpets out of silk. The, the, the making of silk will continue. And I should also add, just as an aside, okay, we're coming to the end here, is that in many ways, the Turks are the heirs to the Byzantines. It's not as, as big as a break as you would expect. I mean, there is a break there, but they did maintain a lot of the traditions of the Byzantines, including the baths and running water, all those things. Another accomplishment of his, there was a great plague, by the way, that killed many people in Constantinople. The emperor himself caught the plague, but he got over it. And one of the methods he used to get rid of the plague was to organize a procession imploring the help of heaven against this plague. And these processions imploring the help of God, of a saint, of our Lord, whatever, 
are very were and still are very much a, a part of Byzantine worship. And remember how Vigilius, as an archdeacon, had been the Apocrisarius, the, the nuncio, the ambassador of the Holy See to Constantinople? In the years, in not that long, a couple of generations after this, Young deacon Gregory, future Pope Gregory the Great, will also be Apocrisarius to Constantinople, and he will so appreciate the processions that he incorporates them into the Roman liturgy. And it's from that day forth that the stational masses begin, where the Pope proceeds from one church to the next, or from the Lateran to the Church of the Day. Under the Byzantines and through Byzantine influence, a lot of what we take for granted in our own liturgy today in, in the West comes through. Now, regarding the law, and I'll end there, because as Gibbon says, this is the most lasting of his monuments. It was promulgated as the law of the West as well. Well, of those parts of the West, which were under Byzantine rule, Italy, coast of Spain, North Africa. But in the Germanic states, what law is there? Roman law continues as codified by Theodosius, but really Germanic custom takes over and it really is an abandonment of Roman principles of law. For example, there's a famous case, and this gives you an idea of what Germanic law was like. Even into the ninth century, one of the descendants of Charlemagne, king of Lotharingia, his name is Lothar II, had accused his wife of infidelity before they were married. He was trying to um, divorce her. And she protested her innocence. How do you tell whether a queen is innocent of um, immorality? Well, you boil some oil, and if she can put her hand in there and pull it out without the hand being harmed, she's innocent. If she pulls the hand out and there are blisters on it, she's guilty. That's the kind of law that you find in the 800s in the West. By the way, in case you're worried about the, the queen's hand, as queen, she had the privilege of proxy and she delegated the task to one of her handmaids. So the queen's okay. End of the story, the handmaid did put her hand in the boiling oil and she pulled it out and her hand was good as new. The queen clearly was innocent. The king still put her away. But that's a little vignette to let you know the difference between Roman law and Germanic custom. And then local customs. I mean, it becomes a bit of a mess in the West until. And this is why Justinian is so well known in the West today, really. In about the 1070s, at the University of Bologna, someone rediscovers the Code of Justinian. And it becomes... The basis, although I don't want to exaggerate it, or it becomes one of the great sources of the legal tradition in the West. It's revolutionary. The Code of Canon Law draws on it. For example, the definition of marriage that is in the Code of Canon Law of the West and East is taken right out of the Justinian Code, among other things. Also, it came right on time for the West because the 11th century, we're getting out of the seculum obscurum, the Dark Age. Italian cities are becoming more commercial. We needed a small, solid law to govern contracts, to govern property. And the Justinian Code, just in the nick of time, was rediscovered. And it helped um, Western kingdoms have a more centralized bureaucracy, and it really in, in great part assisted in the renaissance of the West. Now that I've given you all these details, I'm going to read to you what Justinian himself says to Dante in Paradise. We're at the level of heaven, which is Mercury. I'll read and comment a bit, but in, in a nice way, I think I've given you all the elements you need to understand what he's saying now. Justinian to Dante. After Constantine had turned the eagle counter to heaven's course, the course it took behind the ancient one who wed 
Lavinia, meaning Constantine turned the eagle, moved the seat of empire, counter to heaven's course. So the sun goes from east to west. Well, counter that would be from west to east. So it goes east to settle the eagle in Constantinople. Counter to the way that Aeneas had taken when he founded the Roman people, having left Troy. So going back that way. Then he says, 100 and 100 years and more, the bird of God remained near Europe's borders, close to the peaks from which it first emerged, Constantinople. Beneath the shadow of the sacred wings, it ruled the world from hand to hand, meaning from emperor to emperor, until that governing, changing, became my task. Caesar I was and am Justinian, who through the will of primal love I feel, removed the vain and the needless from the laws, getting rid of those stupid little laws. Before I grew attentive to this labor, I held that but one nature and no more was Christ's. And in that faith, I was content, but then the blessed Agapetus, that's the Pope, he who was chief shepherd, with his words turned me to that faith which has truth and purity. I did believe him and now, and now clearly see his faith as you with contradictories can see that one is true and one is false. As soon as my steps shared the church's path, God of his grace inspired my high task as pleased him. And then it goes on to talk about the reconquest of the West and so forth. I won't go through the whole thing. It's Canto Six of the Paradiso, where we meet Justinian. But then Dante uses the great Justinian to justify his own politics. Dante was in favor of the emperor and against the Pope in ruling Northern Italy. But still, nice words here from Dante, who puts Justinian in heaven, just as the Oriental calendar does. He will die in 565 peacefully, leaving a pretty peaceful empire to his successor, leaving beautiful buildings for Christians to worship in until the Muslims take over, and a code of law which lives today still in the constitutions of several countries of Europe, it inspired the code of Napoleon, which is still the code of most European countries on the continent, um, and wrote canon law. So you see how important an emperor all, of the, all the way over in the east in the days of the Merovingians really has a lasting impact on us today. Sean asks, Dr. Papino, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this, but maybe you can. Why is the church not claiming the church of Hagia Sophia back from the Muslims? Kind of a political question, I know, but. Well, I, I don't know. I, I can imagine <laughs> the reasons. Uh, I don't know. I mean, if you want to go over there with, with Halberd and Helmut and try to take it, I suppose you can. But I, I don't know the answer to the question, really, no. I know that there are some very... There are all sorts of rules about it. I mean, I've been there. It was, it's, well, I think it's a mosque now. Yeah. It, again, it's gone back to being a mosque, which is a little bit frightening, I have to say. It had, when I was there, it was a museum, although Muslims went in there to say prayers anyway. No, I don't know. And there are plenty of places like that all around the Muslim world. And I, I don't know. There's, I mean, I suppose that would be a crusading kind of question. And I, I don't see the current Pope calling for a crusade or anyone else. Oh, it looks like Father wants to jump in on this one. I, only, I would only add this, that don't you ever dare call it by the corruption of its proper name. Its name is and will always be Constantinople. Istanbul is an Arabic corruption of the Greek name. So don't ever call it by its corrupted erroneous name call it by its proper name i found myself in a pizza parlor one time for one of these contests where you get all these questions you know like tri uh, trivia questions you know i refused 
They wanted me to say instant bar. I said, I can call the lady over. I said, I can't. I'm sorry. I'm not going to lie to the people. So I had to get up there in the middle of the pizza parlor, explain to the whole people what its proper name was and why we will take that city back again. I hope we do, Father. It's the Christians there are sadly oppressed. Yes. I mean, even, okay, they're not put in chains, but they live in the shadow of their church and they can't have liturgy in there. That's enough. No, I, I, it's terrible. Yeah, there's an organization that comes on the Sunrise Morning Show a lot called In Defense of Christians, and they talk about Turkey being a major, major problem for Christians yeah. right now. Oh, I remember we were in Cappadocia, my wife and I, you know, for a, and I needed to have my shoe fixed. So I went to the town cobbler and I unthinkingly said, could you have it done by tomorrow? The next day being a Sunday, I, I'd forgotten. He says, no, I'm closed on Sundays. And so I said, oh, you must be a Christian then. And he took two steps back in sheer horror and says, no, 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 no. As though the mere accusation was trouble. It was, it, it opened my eyes a bit. Wow. 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 And for all I know, maybe he was a Christian. I don't know. I mean, he was closed on Sunday. So. Sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, Kelly asks, is Solic law derived from the code of Justinian? No. Salic law is the law of the Franks. Uh, the term Salic law, however, has been used for all sorts. Of, so originally it's just the law of the Franks, the cosmic law of some Germans. But then, in France anyway, the term Salic law has become very elastic, and it may have incorporated some Justinian aspects to it. But one thing, for example, that's in the Salic law that is not original, and that was added in there later on under the Capetians, was the law of primogeniture, namely that only one, the first son, inherits the crown, whereas the Salic Franks themselves, under their own Salic law, divided it up among their sons equally. But no, the Salic law, that's the Frankish law. The Justinian Code comes in later in the West. Awesome. Did I see, Inez, did I see you raising your hand? Go ahead, take yourself off a mute. Who's this now? Um, I just, I, hi, I just wanted to ask if the Justinian had any influence in our laws, in the laws of our country. You mean the U.S.? Yes. No, not really, because the, the well, a legal historian may point to this or that law, but generally speaking, there's really a break in the two kinds of laws that exist in the West. There's the Roman law, the Justinianic law, which prevails on the continent, and then there's the law of the Anglo-Saxons, which is ultimately where the law of this country comes from. So, and the, the, if you like, just to make a very sketch, a, a sketch, Roman law, Justinian law, but even here, the, the idea is there's the law and that's the law. And there's not much room for, in fact, there's no room officially for precedence. You don't judge a case by precedence, you judge a case by what the law says. Whereas in Anglo-Saxon law, precedence takes over this huge role and how cases were decided in the past. Continental law, Justinianic law, leaves no room for that. It's just the law. I guess, and yes, in Louisiana, yes. Because in Louisiana, they have French law. So there, yes, but not federal law, no. Very interesting. All right. I saw Veronica raising her hand. Go ahead. Yes, Veronica. She's been very patient, actually. Hello, Veronica. <laughs> Hi, doctor. Um, I really enjoyed your class. Um, you. So I, I have a question about uh, Justinian's wife, uh, Theodosia. Uh, Theodora, I, uh, yes. Yeah, Theodora, I'm sorry. That's so right. I, I understand that she's considered a saint, a saint in the Eastern tradition, I think. Right, so can is. you tell us more about it? Why is she uh, considered a, a saint over there? Yes, thank you for asking that question. Now, Theodora has become one of those emblematic women of history, like Jezebel, and but also like St. Mary Madeline. Uh, in other words, a, a great, she was a great sinner. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, and she was a heretic, this, that's, which is worse than, you know, any sins against the sixth and ninth commandment, I think. But she is venerated as a saint by some in the East. The Monophysites, just to make a distinction, of course, have a great veneration to her because she's their champion. The or Chalcedonian, Orthodox Orientals, 
cling to the tradition of the great repentance of Theodora. And so for them, she's the great repent, just as Justinian was for Dante, same thing. So, I mean, you won't find it in the history of the time, but again, the history of the time, and this is a problem of historiography of the writing of history, we really rely on him and through his filter, and he does not record the great repentances of Theodora because I think, frankly, Procopius kind of hated Theodora. But the tradition over there is that she did repent. I can't judge on the facts, but that's why they have her and they venerate her as well. So that's the positive thing. If I were to say something negative about the whole thing, I would say that Orientals tend to be dazzled by political power. But I'll say no more because I know Father Hezekiah guys is listening, so I'm not going to go down that road too far. All right. Um, Brady asks, could you touch a bit more on Justinian's, St. Justinian's relations with the Franks? That is, did the treaty establish at least temporary amical uh, relations between the two? Was there any recognition of the Chalcedonian faith to put them on similar terms or were the Byzantines turned off by the barbarians? Okay. Um, from the point of view of orthodoxy, the face that Justinian presented to the Westerners, Franks, Visigoths, Ostrogoths, and Vandals, was that, and to the local populations, was that he was restoring Catholic orthodoxy. So Justinian didn't come in saying, I'm a monophysite. There's this business of Vigilius, which is a sordid affair, to which, by the way, Gibbon devotes le a p less than a paragraph. For, for Gibbon, that's not important. For church historians, it takes on, I think, maybe an exaggerated importance. But from the point of view of the faith, in this instance, Franks and Byzantine troops, which were mostly Orthodox, by the way, shared the same faith in the one person and two natures of Christ. So from that point of view, it was amicable. Now, when the Byzantines were making their way north, the Franks crossed the Alps. And nobody knew what they were coming to do. The Byzantines thought they were coming to ally themselves to them, to them since they share the same Orthodox faith, while the Ostrogoths thought that the Franks were going to join them based on their common Germanic blood. And it's, Gibbon says this, and others confirm it, it's quite possible that the Franks were simply trying to figure out what they could get out of it for themselves alone, maybe you know, gnaw their way into northern Italy. But in the end, the Franks were turned back to Frankland, I guess we can call it, with no harm done. And that's as far as I know. What I don't remember whether there's a treatise between Justinian and the Frankish king. Mm -hmm. um, that I, I couldn't say. I, I don't know. Okay, one last question, Dr. Papino. And that is, so you mentioned it was the, the Hagia Sophia, it's been rebuilt twice since the original time so it's been built well no there are several times there was an original church i think going back to the days of constantine okay and then there was the church that theodosius built and that was burnt to the ground because of the nikai riots then there's hagia sophia that uh, uh justinian built it was shaken and had to be repaired the, the dome had to be rebuilt under his own reign so he was able to rededicate it and it's been standing since then. Okay, I was going to ask, do we have any indication of what the Hagia Sophia looked like originally? No, I mean, we, have, we know the basic shape of it. Excavations have been done, but we do know that it was nothing like the present structure. Wow. It really was Justinian's work. He was not, when Justinian built the Hagia Sophia, he was not simply rebuilding Theodosius's church. He was making his own church under the same title. And it dazzled everyone. That dome was just, he hired uh, the two best known uh, mathematicians, well, geometers uh, of the, the day to design it, in addition to architects. It was, a, it was an astounding feat. And I mean, compared to what the Westerners were barely hanging on to aqueducts, and here in the East we could build, well, they could build such an astounding structure, really says a lot. I mean, there's no Merovingian king who built this, okay? 
it really says a lot about how different East and West had already become. And I would add this also that, I mean, I pointed out the fact that Justinian was bilingual, Latin, Greek, but for, after him, East and West are going to increasingly separate in not as a quarrel, although there will be those two, but you know, customs, traditions, worship, language, culture is going to become increasingly different on the Eastern and Western side until they don't understand each other at all anymore. And that's going to precipitate the break under Photius in the 800s and under ultimately Michael Cerularius and Cardinal Humbert in 1053. Sorry, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Just one last question. What would you say is his greatest accomplishment? Well, it's either everyone is going to say the law, but I think it's that the Hagia Sophia. Mm. That's just me, okay? You can have disagree. But I mean, I, I'll read his law fine, but that, that the, uh, it's feelings, okay? I'm sorry, it's kind of emotional. But when I was under that dome, and you can still see the mosaics, the Muslims didn't destroy the artwork, thank God. They put um, plaster on it. And so when it became a museum, when the Turks became more modern after World War I, they took the plaster off and you can see the mosaics and you stand under that dome and you nearly feel as though you're going to get sucked up into the midair just by the, 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 uh, the, the gravitational force nearly of the dome. It's just unbelievable. Uh -huh. Hagia Sophia for me. Well, law isn't gonna save the world, but beauty will, right? <laughs> Beauty and holy wisdom, let us attend, we'll save the world. Amen to that. Would you close us in prayer, Dr. Pepino? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Saint Agapitus, pray for us. Pray for us. May the blessing of the Lord and his mercy be upon you through his grace and love for mankind at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen.